Trading Nutanix is out with its first quarterly report as a public company. Investors sent shares lower in Wednesday trade after the company posted a wider loss. Joining us now from Scottsdale, Arizona for an exclusive interview, Nutanix CEO Deeraj Pandey. Deeraj, thank you so much uh, for joining us today on the show. So a strong report, but investors didn't love it. What's going on? Well, I think you know, it's just been 24 hours since the results. We look at things on a kind of longer term, for the next uh, three months, six months, 12 months. That's the way stock should be looked at as opposed to 24 hours. So Nutanix shares soared post IPO, but they are down from the peak. In fact, they rose so much, it surprised uh, a lot of people in the market. And, and there was talk that perhaps uh, shares were, were initially Ms. Price, talk to us about your vision for the hybrid cloud and how it plays out uh, in the realm of Microsoft and Amazon and Google, which are at war for territory here. I mean, if you think about it right now, there's one real leader in cloud, and that's uh, AWS. Uh, Microsoft has done a lot of work with O365, which is their office application uh, cloud, and then they have Dynamic CRM, but Azure is still supposed to be tested at scale, which it hasn't, and Google is still in the very early days of thinking about what products, what services is going to build in the cloud itself. So at scale, there's only one cloud, that's Amazon. And even that has not been tested for the global 5,000. I mean, they have some really large customers, you know, 10, 15, 20 of those, that probably drive, uh, that they drive majority of the revenue from. So what is going to look for the global 2,000, the global 5,000, which spends, um, you know, probably 80% of the IT spend comes from these 5,000 companies. And they have complexity of different kinds, which is not what the long tail of SMB customers of Amazon see, or these internet companies that Amazon actually has. I think that's where the real frontier of cloud really is going to be. What do you do about legacy? What do you do about you know, uh, operating in 100 countries? What do you do about hybrid networking, hybrid security? You know, everything has to become hybrid, and the operating system has to straddle the two sides of the aisle itself. And this is a massive computer science problem, a massive user interface design problem that uh, nobody's really scratched the surface of yet. So how do you see the cloud and the hybrid cloud evolving? Where are we in five to 10 years when it comes to the cloud? You know, it's very similar to, you know, in your last, uh, you know, uh, guest that you had on your, uh, on your uh, program talking about how you go from current cars to semi-autonomous to autonomous. I think there's a very similar journey here. It's not like all of computing that used to be on-prem is going to all of a sudden become rented because there's value in owning and renting. You know, things that people want to own because they're predictable. It's like you don't want to go and rent a hotel for three, five years if you know you're going to live at a place. So you're not going to rent a car for three, five years if you know you need a car for the next three, five years. So I think there's going to be this uh, yin-yang between owning and renting that will basically shake itself up in the next three to five years. And do you and, think uh, owning will go away stages. at some point? I don't think so because you know if you think of again going back to I mean you uh, own a house you own a car it's not like these things are going to go away simply because there's Uber and Airbnb I think computing is very similar when you know that you're going to spend this much and your workloads are this predictable it's much cheaper to own than to rent because you know renting has this uh, sort of extra premium that's attached to it in terms of pricing and the cost that you might just pull the plug tomorrow and somebody needs to make money off of that optionality, which is what happens with hotel rooms and rental cars and so on. Now, you went public just ahead of the election, and I'm curious what advice you would have for companies and CEOs who are considering doing this right now, especially enterprise companies. Uh, what might you do differently, and what might you recommend in this political environment? Well, I think the new political environment probably doesn't change much in terms of uh, IPOs, but obviously there's some policy decisions that will actually happen in the coming, uh, you know, probably year or two around immigration, around manufacturing more in the U.S., you know, things of that nature, maybe what happens when U.S. and Russia become friends as opposed to enemies that they are today. I think there's a lot of things that are up in the air right now about business uh, in Russia and in CIS states and so on. But all in all, I think the IPO experience actually taught me that you want to have a win-win relationship with investors as opposed to trying to squeeze it all. And uh, you want to really understand that your employees and customers and partners are still as important as stakeholders as they were when you were a private company. So that okay. you don't over-rotate on this new stakeholder and try to just maximize the shareholder value, 
when you know that it's actually a second order benefit and the first order is employees, customers and partners.